What do you think we should do about giving campers the choice over how their own program runs? Hello, Camp Mavericks, and welcome to the Camp Packer Podcast, brought to you by Ultra Camp and the Camp Recruiting and Retention Playbook from Joanna Warren Smith and me. I'm Travis Allison. I'm a summer camp marketing consultant specializing in getting parents to open, read, and act on your emails and other communications. Hi, everyone. My name is Chris Hudson. I am the founder and director of Camp Highlight, a sleepaway camp for kids who have LGBTQ parents. It is The Rock's favorite camp. Believe it or not, don't believe it. I've never met The Rock. I'm also a camp consultant and all-around good time guy. Hi, my name is Dan Weir. I spent 25 years operating summer camps, and then I switched to the dark side of providing support services because I'll never say the word consultant. I work with <laughs> everything from summer camps and nonprofits, and I have a separate entity that I work especially with Y Day Camps called Day Camp Community. What's up, y'all? I'm Jack Shot. I'm the founder, and I do other stuff for the Summer Camp Society. We're a group of camp directors that get together and try and help each other do more cool stuff. Um, tend to be progressive, tend to be uh, younger. And um, I founded uh, Camp Stomping in 2015 with Laura Kriegel, where we dug in to having choice at camp. And the way we got here is that Dan Weir and I um, were arguing about um, choice versus not choice for a long time. And I think I finally moved Dan over (laughs) to the side of darkness oh. the yeah, side of dark, light really darkness. the side of opportunity the side opportunity. of, the side of young people having well, also, having a less oppressive nature from grown-ups okay <laughs> the side of equity the side of okay. inclusion okay let's uh, all can we can we ease reach. the listener uh, in can, no. can we just no can we slow no. down <laughs> they're they're lowering their car radio right now i apologize <laughs> um yeah uh mm-hmm. do you do you want me to just keep going off of Jack's energy and just definitely let's uh, let I want to define what we're talking about because some people won't understand yes. even camper mm-hmm. choice, bear program choice, yes, etc. So if you if you don't mind, one of you start yeah, there. Let me then lead this in. Chris and I are looking story. forward to jumping in. So um I mentioned in my intro, I switched over to the dark side last year of support services. And it's very funny to go from operating to then seeing camps and then immediately. You can see signs right away when you walk on a property. And it's different than an ACA site visit. ACA site visit, everyone's putting the best foot forward. You don't do that when you're having a hired services or just a friend drop by because some of them were just friend visits. And um, the truth is all the consultants call each other in between the summer. They never share like what camp, but they they share notes just because you see trends. And so I'm calling Jack, driving from New Hampshire to New Jersey. And I basically kind of have this epiphany that like elective-based programming is meeting kids needs in a different way than group-based programming and i spent years running group-based programming partly because it was logistically easy and partly because i oversaw some pretty large operations and i thought that was the way it had to be done but i I all matched up at the same time that i'm watching this giant shift with our culture of individualism the cultural uh, sorry from collectivism to individualism meaning that I'm watching basically kids not being able to be bored and watching people really want their individual needs and wanting it right now. And everything we get is like right in front of our face. And so it was funny. So I called Jack up and I'm telling Jack this. He's like, yeah, welcome to my side. I've been saying this only forever. And um, we talked for about three and a half hours until I had to go to the bathroom at a rest stop. And then we, I called him back. I was like, by the way, we're making this into a session and we did it at two conferences. And it was wonderful. And that's it. So it's a, it's really group based programming versus elective based programming, and there's so much nuance into it, not only the operation side, but also just like the, just the the framing of it. And we get so emotionally tied to what we've done in the past, which I think is also interesting. But yeah, that's that's the tee up is you should be doing more elective based programming. I want to make sure that the lingo is common amongst all of our listeners. So please tell yeah. me what you mean by elective based versus. Elective based versus group based is that the the terms you use, Dan? Yeah, so it doesn't matter day camp or overnight camp or sleepaway camp or resident camp, you know, because that's lingo as well too, depending on mm-hmm. where you are in the world. Mm-hmm. I watch a stark difference in camper behavior, camper satisfaction, and staff satisfaction between the camps. They keep the kids together all day in one group, so like you know, it's typically separated by age and gender, 
they travel from one activity to another, do an activity, and then they travel to another one and do that. Versus the camps that are more elective based, if not completely elective based. And when I say the word elective based, I mean campers' choice. Um, you can have it pre registration, you know, like you use your camp minder form and have it all synced out or any of the other softwares, right? Or you actually do it more in terms of like you're letting the kids sign up when they come on the first day of uh, your program. Or you're even doing it just based on the period saying, hey, we're doing this, this period and this, this period. Pick A or B or even more choices than that. And just the autonomy and agency it provides youth is just so distinct and it frames everything so differently that like I knew it should be a part of the camp day. But it's never been more stark to me. And Jack is like, yeah, I've known this for a while. It's never been more stark to me that's meeting kids' needs today. I think kids have changed radically in the past five years. And mm -hmm. I, I, you know, and I, I like, I could keep going, but um, I'm stopping myself there. So, well, I think, Jack, you're certainly known in the industry what you and Laura did to really talk about a kid's first programming style. I really want to come back to individual versus collective, but let's just go with um, with that. And you're th some of the first is such strongly, so strongly advocate for the kids having a lot of choice. Also, coming from um, working for our friend James two years ago, when that was pretty very radical um, with the stuff that James had done, and when you folks worked at Vandercamp with him. Yeah, I, I think that really the elective. Something that's interesting about the 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 words we use in camp mm. around are not universal. We say mm. them like they're universal and they aren't. Yep. Like elective based tends to be used by private camps. Um, tend to be wealthy private camps will use the term elective based, whereas like the Y might use um choice based as um uh, or like, I mean, you see this with like bunks versus cabins versus groups, mm -hmm. like different things all, often are very similar, but have like nuance and you, I say different things. So when I think about it, what I'm talking about is who has the locus of control in any given moment? Um, do I, as the camper, get to decide how to spend my time or is someone else making decisions for me about how I spend my time? And like at Stomping Ground, we are like pretty far uh, on the end of the locus of control is with the camper as much as possible, but not all the time. Everybody's got to be supervised, right? Like that's a, that's a law in New York state. Everybody's got to be supervised. Also at stomping ground, everybody goes to the dining hall to eat meals. Also at stomping ground, there are bedtimes. There wasn't the first night of camp uh, in 2015. Uh, and then uh, Chris's uh, co-founder, uh, Jackie saw uh, Laura and I talking about this at Tri-State and said, you know what? no bedtimes these people are outside their minds let me send my kids um <laughs> and they've story. been long time long time campers at at stomping ground um but so so like uh and i'm not at stomping ground at the moment so i don't know the exact nuances of, of where they exactly are at any given time but the goal of stomping ground from the beginning was how do we give kids as much control over each moment of their day as possible and at summer camp at sleepaway camp in new york state that is not the only thing that we do at Stomping Ground. There are uh, check-ins that happen after um, after breakfast, after lunch, before kids go to bed. There are um, it's not it's not total Lord of the Flies at um, at Stomping Ground by any stretch of the imagination. However, there is a push toward as much choice as possible, as much of the locus of control being with the individual as possible, with a shared mission around radical empathy that I think creates collectivism with individuals. Chris, to be clear, right? When you say the locus of the controls with the campers, they don't get to control the schedule. They just get to control their activities during specific points in the schedule where there are options, right? So uh, sort of, Stomping Ground has a, a model that is basically, it's not exactly this exactly, but it's basically every hour, um, there are a set of options that kids can choose from, let's say six options. But if you don't want to go to any of those options, you can hang out in downtown, downtown Stomping, Ground, Stomping Ground, which is yeah. like a recess area. There's Gaga, Carpet Ball, Arts and Crafts, da 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 Or you can sit and do nothing. Nothing, quote unquote, nothing. Hang out in a hammock and do whatever. So so Stomping Ground is 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 quite far on the spectrum of, of where kids can choose their choice, but not 
you know, I, I was at a camp uh, this summer for two weeks called Not Back to School Camp in Oregon. If you want to go wiling out, what are kids doing? That's like totally wackadoo. Um, not Back to School Camp full of unschoolers. Sign me up. It was awesome. And it's way further on the uh, the choice mile. So I, I, I'm not sure how we, we don't. I, I My intention is not to to be out here trying to radicalize people on like the, <laughs> the most wiling out uh, version of this. I do love it. I do love it. And I think that we can do more to give kids more power, more control, more autonomy than we believe is possible. However, I also think that if we just start letting kids choose whether to go to archery or arts and crafts, the stakes are very low. Yeah. Correct. Why? I, I'm waiting for the really good argument for why we wouldn't do that. And here's some of the arguments that I hear. Dan, Dan, Dan has given them to me uh, often, which is like, well, uh, if we let kids choose, then they'll make less friends. I don't agree. Yeah, well, I told um, you all that one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you try, you 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 know you made me that argument. Um, if we let kids um, choose, then they won't be exposed to all the different areas of camp. Okay, good point. Yeah. So far, I'm on Jack's side. So, Sorry, so, Dan. No, 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 no. So let's. I'm going to talk about this paradigm shift that I had. Not make it about me, but because let's talk about your conversion, Dan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, all right, so like podcast now. when Jack, Jack and I started talking about this, yeah, exactly. It was just this crossfire uh, camp <laughs> version for for anyone gray hair remembers that awful show. Um, so I, you know, years ago, I'm I'm saying this to Jack. I think it's also like I grew up at my camp, and you you tend to subscribe to your own beliefs in these moments, right? Like you just love what you're doing so much that you're so passionate about it. And um, so I was like, no, I'm advocating for this because I really believe in it and I see it work. I, I've, I'm not the only one on this call. I, we've watched social skills just drop dramatically, not only amongst children, but also amongst adults. And I really used to believe that if you have a shared experience amongst people and they're all in this stage of new, that's kind of a leveling ground and that they kind of have the shared experience together. And then it basically allows for them to open up because they're all trying something new. My wife has this all the time. She teaches pottery and like she gets like these people in there have never done pottery before and they have a great time. But the social skills has declined so much that their confidence is shot. And so kids are almost not engaging anymore with things that they consider risky because they don't even have the basic confidence level of taking on previous tasks. So I really believe in this, like that we we basically almost have like a skills lag and frankly, a lot of it stems from boredom because they're overstimulated. We're all overstimulated. My, I've gotten six notifications just while we've been on this call. That's even just since we were recording. We were on the call before we had record, right? So like, we're just constantly being fed these little like indicators that were wanted. And then for us to feel awkward or to feel not confident, and uh, it just, it really just shatters us. And so I, I love the fact that the camper choice is automatically teeing the person up for the fact that you chose this, right? So that means that there's some part of you that is feeling like you see yourself there and it, it's kind of raise, rising your perceived notions of confidence. And then you might be awful at the actual activity, but like I just watching that. And so like, I look at these kids' behaviors and um, this is a funny story. I had, we had, uh, my wife was a camp person too at heart. And so we, for our eight-year-old's birthday, we had everyone come over, um, uh, meaning she had a dozen friends come over. So we had a dozen eight-year-old girls come by for uh, basically three hours. And we gave them choices along the way. It was great. But any time that they felt like they didn't have a choice in what they were doing, they were tearing down our house. They were literally tearing down our house. They could not take being bored. And so when I talk about this topic, it's very personal to me in the sense that like we need to meet where youth's needs are and our industry sometimes gets stuck and this is how we've done it and it works. And I would, I think this is more of an answer to meeting kids' needs than ever before. When, when I used to argue with Jack about this, I would think about my daughter who loves structure. My 10-year-old loves structure. And I think the answer is really a hybrid at the end of the day for some camps as well. But like, I really look at this as meeting children's needs. It's also, frankly, your camp should be full right now. Like, the, like your, if your camp isn't full, it's either a marketing issue or a program issue. It's one of the two. But um, never has it been more apparent that kids need camp and benefit from camp. 
And I just think it's our job to adapt to kids' needs. That's really it. So, you know, it's Travis, a bit of a rant, but. Travis, you hear this and we're all, we're all sort of, sort of smelling our own farts right now, right? We're all kind of going, uh, yeah, choice, 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 which you know me, I love to hear because it's not how everyone has always uh, interacted with this uh, idea in the camp world. But Travis, you work with a lot of camps. What is what are the barriers? What makes this hard? What why why aren't we? Why is this still something that that we're spending time digging into? There there must be reasons. Yeah, I so I, I'll give you a couple of perspectives on that, and and I admit that a lot of them are because that's the style of camp that I know. Um, and so why not make this switch to just having your kids choose uh, in each period? I think that um, that some camp directors feel the absolute need to be able to answer a parent's call at any time of the day and say, I know where your kid is. So I think that's one thing. And if there's choice, you know, it might be written down on a piece of paper. You might have to chase down a clipboard and or call out to arts and crafts or something to find a kid just so you know and i don't think a camp director would feel comfortable saying to a parent um i don't know can i call you back um so i i think that's it might be one of the 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 concerns with that is just being able to say and i i i think the right answer to that is uh i don't know i'll figure it out and i'll call you back like, i i think we should be able to say that to parents because the kids should have that little freedom and the parents should have the experience of having a time at camp where they don't know where their children are all the time they've just committed to a safe environment they put them in there so so that that's one argument that i would definitely hear my own experience growing up and as a camp director, and look, I was a camp director last 15 years ago, so my experience is elderly, not not current. But I have seen um, I, I have seen all sides of this since um, getting to do, as Jack said, getting to see lots of camps in action. So our experience was we wanted that group or unit or cabin or bunk to go to have the conversation. That was the important part for us was to have a conversation amongst the people in your group and say, this is what I want to do. Work through the problems of, well, I want to do this and I don't want to do this. And basically try to sort that out over the six days that they were with us. So that conversation was the important part for us. Not that they went everywhere as a unit, but that is, uh, um, it was just sort of the unit style was, was what we grew up with. And so we wanted them to have the practice of that, that conversation. Now, having said that, I have seen, um, and I, I mean, I started to see things that made me think that there were other great possibilities and then had several conversations with Jack and Laura while they're talking things through and with James as well. And one thing I noticed is that short camps, five, six day camps tended to do more unit focused stuff and then individual programming more for longer camps that were two to four or six or eight weeks long. And I love seeing kids who are seven or eight having the independence to walk from one side of the camp to the other, to go from the waterfront out to the climbing wall and have being responsible for making sure they had their own closed toed shoes. And like, I love seeing that, but I saw that work better at a longer term, a longer session camp. Uh, so that's that's a couple of perspectives on it, and um, but I, I I think camper choice and and the the objective of free play um, would have been quite appealing to me as a camper. I I am am I struggling? Go for it. I'm trying. I'm struggling to like. This is like one of those conversations where I'm like, well, of course the children should choose what they do. Like I I'm trying to see from the other point of view. But also, like, I, this is why I asked the clarifying question before, is like making sure we're not talking about free play campers run amok, because Jack had to apologize and be like, it's not like it's Lord of the Flies. And I was like, I wasn't even dreaming it would be. Like, I dream that, I dream this chaos is being contained on either side by time markers, right? Because like you said, they all have to eat at the same time, uh, or they all have to go to bed at roughly the same time at Stomping Ground. So, uh, you know... Okay, me, I love being intentional about everything I can, right? 
So if we are doing it by unit or cabin, or if campers are choosing, the, my only question about, well, which one should we do is, well, why should we do either? Okay. So like, as, as a camp director, you know, I, I'm a social worker and I have been a teacher. I try very hard to divorce camp from school as much as possible because that's a lot of barrier for especially for young kids. And I want them to experience the freedom earlier that school and schooling doesn't allow. Having them move in class, as it were, is just too much of a reference point to school, which it's my goal to break that as quickly as possible. So like just the practical case for the choice makes sense. On top of that, on like the social emotional learning side of that, like allowing the children to explore that. What do I want to do? How do I express that? What do my friends want to do? How do I compromise and have that conversation with them in small groups? It's just, it's so rich. It's so much richer than you could have than moving the kids together in a unit. Now, uh, you know, and Jack mentioned this in the chat, like parents who are like, where's my kid right now? You have to tell me right now. No, don't take a breath. I need to know right now where they are. That is a marketing problem. First of all, parents need to know that they cannot assault you like that. And I have to say, like, I've never I've ever, you know, in like 30 years of being on a camp and, and 13 directing a camp, like never ever have I received a call from a parent. And they're like, they, they all ask because they will. Where's my kid? What are they doing right now? I, my answer has always been uniformly, I don't know right now because my job isn't to be your kid's backpack. You know what I mean? Like I've got other things to do. That's just like a communication problem with parents in general. And as far as like the other thing you brought up, Travis, as far as like working through, how do we work through this problem? Like it doesn't have to be unit-based. I think it's much more impactful and it is it has so much more rich room for growth if the child has that conversation with people they want to engage with with their friends, because that's really where the work is going to be. But I think, Dan, I know you got a point. So I just want to hit Chris's and then I'll hand it over to you. Uh, I My way of thinking at the time was, do we go for friendships that are deep or friendships that are wide? Like if you have a group that you're spending six days with and you have to have very difficult conversations, you can build trust within that group um, versus a... Um, why? So lots of kids that you're seeing lots of times, you're not repeating sessions necessarily, like you're not going to canoeing with the same group of kids every afternoon. So um, so I'm not saying it's right. I'm just saying that that was our thinking at the time is do we give them an opportunity, a safe place where they know people? Dr. G has often talked about um, camp having touch, kids needing like a safe touch point. You know, they can they can explore groups that they have their parents there to just go in and check with and then go back out. So that was kind of our thinking. Dan, I, I cut you off. I want to hear what you uh, wanted to say. No, I, I just wanted to share another story. So so Jack, and I did this presentation presentation twice. We did it at um, first at Campfire, YMCA Campfire, which is uh, basically 250 folks, uh, it's, uh, Southeast, a um, lot of day camp folks, a lot of people that were voluntold to go to a conference because uh, they used to run childcare and now they're going to run day camp. And so Jack and I are, um, he just did, he just does keynote. He walks in and, you know, the nice thing about team presenting is like, you really can play off each other. And so we're playing off each other. And um, somebody in the audience in the group asks, well, what do I do if I, it's a one staff member and 25 kids, like, how do I pull this off? And I remember Jack looks at me and he's like, uh, uh, <laughs> and I was like, I'll take this one. Um, uh, I, the, the first thing I do is I teach you how to talk to your boss about getting you more staff because having that high of a staff ratio is not realistic. And I recognize the, you know, there's probably a lot of camps here ACA accredited that are listening to this, but you know, Jack and I have often talked about, about equity and it, you you talk about it so well in your observations as well, Jack. So I'm going to push it to you when we talk about like the price point of this as well and, and expectations and how that correlates to equity. Well, uh, if you just look at camps that charge a lot of money, almost none of them are making kids stay in groups all day going around. It's just not happening. We only do this to poor kids coming to camp. It's like, oh, oh yeah, well, we'll give black kids a free camp experience and we'll tell them what to do all the time because we know what to do. Uh, it's the same in, in schools. It's like no disrespect to, uh, to KIPP schools, disrespect to KIPP schools, but they're just going around just uh, being like, we know what's best for uh, poor kids, so we'll tell them what to do, as opposed to uh, all the rich kid schools 
are Quaker schools and sort of softer progressive schools that are trying to figure out how to meet kids where they're at. And so like it, it, there, that's not totally true. There are military schools that cost a bunch of money. There's whatever, whatever. But in general, in general, across the board, wealthy public schools are trying to give kids more choice, more opportunity to choose their, their electives and things like that. And um, schools for poor kids aren't. And so we're, we're just continuing that at, uh, at camp. So, um, and, but back to what, what Chris said, which was, um, I want to know why I want to know why I, I'll tell you why to run group programming, forced group programming. And, and I'm going to call it forced group programming. Cause that's what it is. It's forced. You're forcing kids to do stuff at stomping ground. They force the kids to go to meals together. They do. That's uh, I'm naming. I always want to name what we do. We for that's that's the we we compel the them. And, and it's not are dramatic here, Jack. It's not force, a fight. We force the kids to eat. Like, yeah, we, we force the kids to go to the dining hall. We don't force them to eat at stomping ground. We force them to go to the dining hall. Okay. If they want to opt out, it becomes really complicated. Okay. We've got to do okay. all kinds of things. We got to like stomping ground has like a hundred social workers. Like everybody there is on their way to becoming a social worker. Like it's like all everybody's so soft and wants to love everyone. Like I'm, don't get me wrong, I'm not out here trying to be like, but that's what happens. Like you you don't have a choice, so you're forced. That's that's those are the rules. And so, um, but like if we're looking at it, like uh, why are we doing it? If we're going to do group programming, what we are saying is, um, kids, I think it's really important for you to learn what your elders think is best for you. As a kid, life is going to be hard. Let's make sure it's hard here so you get used to it. These are not necessarily the wrong. I'm not saying that this is wrong. This is a thing that we're saying. We're uh, we're saying grownups know better than you. Respect. Listen to what you're what you're told. Some things are going to be hard. You can grit and get you can have grit and you can get through it. Um, these are things that can be taught. It's sometimes worthwhile to do things that you don't want to do. I'm not I, I do things I don't want to do all the time. And a group based programming is reinforcing those those ideals. They're saying you can get over it. And choice based programming is reinforcing this idea that decision making is the number one skill that we need to learn. As we grow up, the world is becoming more open. There are more choices. We have to learn how to make decisions how to manage phone time, how to manage screen time, how to choose whether to be on TikTok or not, whether to, you know, decision-making to me is the number one skill that we need to learn so that we can feel, we can see the how our decisions impact ourselves and the other people around us. Um, and so if that's what we want, if, if what I'm hoping for kids to learn is how their decisions impact themselves and other people around them, I have to give them a chance to practice that. There's, there's, there are so few places on the planet where that is something that kids get to practice. Um, Chris, Jack, you had, you know, when you started that off, you, you, you made, you were making an, like, an economic argument is choice-based programming versus, uh, you know, unit-based programming. Is there an economic difference in running programs like that? Uh, I think that there are camps that operate uh, coming from a childcare model and they have somebody that, that above them that said, yeah, this just works. It's not actually best practice. And I, uh, I think I have a lot, I actually, it's very funny. Like a lot of the work I do with folks is like gently re-educating them is the short version. You know, like I, 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 I do staff trainings. I help, you know, like, camps of sales and marketing but a lot of the work i'm really doing is working with nonprofits and helping them re-educate on what the concepts of camp they think what they think camp is and what they think a camp program is and and trying to make them better you know because when you look at the fundamentals of why their program is missing the mark or why they have high risk issues or why you know frankly uh they don't get the big donor base or you know like or they want to charge more tuition so it's sustainable you know like it like it's just like all these things kind of play into each other um and, and it's frankly it's easier you know if you have two jobs if you have a comma in your job title <laughs> or three commas or four commas in your job title which many of my nonprofit friends do i feel for you and it's sometimes easier to do the group-based programming as well too um and i think everybody always wants to do right by kids always and i think we all have big hearts but i also think that where kids are today, their needs are met more by involving a bit more choice. You could certainly have group-based programming. I, I'm not saying 
scrap it. But I am saying that the parallel with equity is very interesting to watch. Um, you know, and it's a lot of things in life. You know, it's everything from like hotels to restaurants to mm. any other forms of service, right? So we got deep. We got very deep. <laughs> it, got, yeah. it got wide. I I uh I think there's definitely a space cool. for group based programming absolutely and i mean just to be clear no one i mean i'm not saying that one is bad and the other one's good i'm just saying there's advantages to each uh depending on what your program is and what your goals are because you can have your entire group of campers do one thing the way you scaffold to that the the way that you build to that the 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 you can still give them control to certain degrees i mean i don't have to design a program right now on, on live on air but like you could you could figure out a way to introduce choice even to something that is like a mass group thing you know because again i'm also i'm always coming from the sel angle like why are we doing this how is it enhancing the children like you said dan like there was I, the correct answer that's right. There is a correct answer. And here it is. Is like, it's going to be a mixture of both of these things because there's things to learn here. I think any, any one choice, it just, there's no camp that goes one way. And not that anyone was suggesting that, but even at stomping ground and they have to force the kids to go to the dining hall and maybe not to eat, but that's just a supervisory problem. That's a real life practical thing that the kids have to do. You know what I'm saying? So they all have to be in the same place at the same time. Now, when we do that around activities, we can be really thoughtful about one, how that's presented, two, you know, um, how and how to and two, how that plays out. If it really is all right, all right, kids, we're going to archery, let's all march there, as opposed to at the beginning of the week on Friday, we're all gonna do something together. The options are archery, arts and crafts, or crocodile wrestling. And then they have all week to do all of their in-group and out-group stuff, right? The, the real world, real life stuff of trying to bridge gaps and compromise to have that single choice at the end of the week, what they all do. I'm, okay, don't crocodile wrestle at your camp. Unless you're in Florida, then do whatever because apparently the laws support you. But what I'm trying to say here is that like we can we can design whatever we want as long as we're intentional about it and it serves the children, full stop. Chris, I'm, I'm with you on that. And I, I... Here's here's where I, I sometimes push back. I think that we say the word intentional and then everyone just, it's like saying like um, uh, the insurance company said or safety first, everyone just starts nodding. You know, it's like, oh, just be intentional. And everyone just nods and agrees. And uh, I agree with with you. Let's be intentional. Where I, where I want to push people a tiny bit further is often in camp, the word intentional gets conflated with I am the grownup who has control over the outcome. We say, I'm being intentional and therefore I'm telling kids what to do more. So what they do is what I believe should happen is, I, I, is, is my take on the word intentional. It's not, it's not necessarily what you're saying. It is what sometimes is said. It's when not I what you're said, saying I, at all. I mean, thoughtful, just and, to be and, clear. Yeah, I mean, thoughtful. And so I agree with you. There are re like, if we're going to say we're going to do group based programming, then let's be intentional about it. And then let's be willing to debate whether or not it's more, um, whether it's more intentional or not. So like Chris, uh, uh, Travis says, uh, I think friendships get deeper when you are um, in one group for longer, as opposed to having choice to spend time with people. Let's, then let's debate it. Let's, let's debate whether we believe that's true or not. And Travis and I could debate that for 30, 45, three hours um, on air. We're not going to do that right now, but it, it becomes something. Now we have, we can have a debate. And that, to me, that's the important thing is that we are trying to be more intentional by debating the ideas because we're saying this is the direction we want to go. I, I could be proven. I believe that decision making is is the the number one skill. It's the mother skill that we need to be helping kids develop right now. However, in a new world, 10 years from now, the number one skill might be something else. And then choice might not be the cornerstone of the idea that we should be having. And there's um there's a great book called Range that uh I, I recommend the folks when they they get down on themselves like oh I don't I have this wide range of job experience I'm not um I'm not specialized. Uh and there's book range is all about how you need a range and experience, right? Mm -hmm. And I think I think have have it all like is a short version. But like um but if you're really digging into group base and you want that to be your intentional thing, then read the book range. Highly recommend it. It's a it's a great book. Thank you all. There's so many, the, the, 
every one of these conversations, like we have to have another conversation about this because I'm really interested in the individual versus collective thing. And I think that that how culture has changed around that. I think there's something deep that Cam can do to explore that. Um, and so just time-wise, we have to leave it there. So thank you um, for Dan and Jack for saying, hey, we have this really cool idea. Can we come and talk about it? It's great to have you both back. Um, definitely want to pick up on that that uh, that one piece that, that's an outcome of this. Um, so what we'll do now is move us on to our tool of the week. Dan, I'm going to go to you first, please. What is your tool of the week? Yeah, um, I highly recommend it's like 15 bucks on Amazon or wherever you buy your electronics. But these lapel mics that hook up to your phone, um, uh, just this summer, just start recording content. Uh, interview kids about what they like about camp. It's actually, you know, it's great for just sending sending clips home to families, but I, I'm just telling people to load up on content because uh, as you look at the ways to fill your camp in the future, it's about engaging content on multiple different platforms. And so if you have these mics, they're 15 bucks. They're actually really great quality. I've had this, these two for about a year and a half and they're fantastic. And you could film solid quality interviews, or even just funny segments with your kids, 10 to 15 seconds long, a minute long, and just have a bank for your your whole year of marketing. So I just highly recommend them. They're well worth it. And plus, it's just fun to mess around with your friends and your kids on them. So. And they have a pretty good range, too. So you could have the camera back and or put a mic on somebody yeah. to during a thing. <laughs> I've had 15 feet. I've had 15 feet. Yeah. No problem. Yeah. Yeah. And hey, you can do that TikTok thing where you, uh, this is the podcaster of me, where I go get shivers every time, just mad shivers, where people talk right into their microphone and it's so plosive because they're holding that thing here instead of clipping it onto themselves and getting it the mic this proper distance. It's a, it's a side benefit of that tool. You can look like a TikToker when you use Dan's mics. Dan, thank you so much. I know that you have to run. If people need to get in touch with you, Kim, how, how can they do that? Yeah. Um, uh, so um, there's Immersive First website where I work with any camp, work with any nonprofit. And then there is Day Camp Community, um, where I work specifically with Y Day Camps because they need turnkey solutions ready to go. They go from childcare to, to day camp on a, over a weekend. And so um, I work with both of those. And then uh, generally, Dan loves camp on most media channels. But uh, feel free to reach out. I'm, I'm just talking about camp all day, every day. And uh, my, yeah, that's it. I got to go get the kids off the bus. So thank you for your time. Thanks for being back at Camp Hacker. It's great to see you. As usual, you can check the show notes at camphacker.tv slash podcast and see those links. Thanks, Dan. You're welcome. Uh, Jack, what is your tool? Well, I love that Dan's uh, pushing content marketing as the uh, the number one way to, to do that. And it relates back to what we're talking about with choice and equity. And all of what we're talking about is the more we're making content that is um, driving toward our values, the more people are opting into and are excited about us uh, giving choice to kids or insert whatever other values you're trying to bring into your camp so that when you get the call from the parent that says, hey, where's my kid right now? The answer is um, they are probably at one of these three things and da 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 um, And it, it relates back to we're getting more free range parents because we're selling a free range product. Um, okay, so here's my tool of the week. It's a, it's a sort of... Um, uh, AI is going to change everything about uh, how we run camp. Um, it's it's drastically changing so much about um, what's going to happen behind the scenes, right? And so I want to know what's coming. And no one knows what's coming, but there's this like sort of um, famous quote that's the best way to predict the future is to invent it. And so I want to be listening to the people who are very connected to what's coming in AI, in tech. And so um, I encourage everyone to go find some tech podcasts so that you're hearing the people talking about building the future because there's stuff that's already being done that we haven't yet gotten, but it's coming to us, right? It's on its way to to us in camp, to you in your everyday life. Uh, and so one that I would recommend is uh, it's called the All In Podcast. It's it's for billionaires talking about stuff. So take everything they say with a grain of salt. Like, listen, they're, they say stupid stuff. They're relatively anti-woke. They are obnoxious about a lot of things. And 
they are seeing things about AI and about technology that I can't see. And so if I want to have access to that information, I've got to then take some L's on that they say stupid stuff about how RFK or what about cares. people you care about. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> anyway, uh, worth listening to. Chris. Right on. Thank you. I appreciate the perspective, Jack. Because when you're saying, uh, listen to tech podcasts, my first thing was going to be, yes, been trying to find a tech podcast that isn't a bunch of straight white dudes talking about I know. stuff. So. I, um... I, is I that, is that that's not this that case? Is that correct? They are not all white dudes. They're all dudes. <laughs> they're they're all dudes. dudes. They're three. They're three white dudes and and one brown guy. It's like it is. And they're that. all billionaires. And they're all billionaires. <laughs> it, so uh, I'm I mean, sorry, but 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 uh, that's fine. We don't have to agree with everything they say. And I'm not saying that I want to have that podcast. What what I'm saying is they give me access to information that I normally that's wouldn't right. have access right, to. Right. So that then I have pathways to make the world better in the ways that I believe it can be better. And so more information is better for me in that regard, even if it's, you know, it comes with some bullshit. Understood. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that. That is, I appreciate the, the perspective expansion as usual, Jackson. Thanks. Uh, my tool of the week is a, um, a noise reduction earplug called Calmer. From a company called Flare. Flare is known for um, making in ear monitors for musicians. And they have these silicone um, earplugs that can go in that are, that do one particular thing, which is cut down on certain frequencies of noise, but without reducing the volume of the noise. So it's really interesting because it's one of those things that you put them in and you can't necessarily tell the difference. You wear them for a couple of hours and pull them out and you're like, oh, there's the difference right there. So I'm sure lots of you have seen the zillions of ads for loop earrings because um, they are everywhere. And Zoom earrings, Zoom earplugs are, Zoom, <laughs> loop earplugs are fine for what they're fine for. They just don't work for me because I'm losing my hearing. I cannot handle any reduction in the amount of the volume of what's coming into my ears. I just have to cut out some of the stuff that I find painful, annoying, distracting. And these do that. Um, and so as usual, go to campacker.tv slash podcast for the notes on this. I am putting out there that my pick for this is the calmer earrings from a company called Flare. And I found them great. I wore them all day, every day at Tri-State. And I didn't have that feeling in the back of my neck that I get really cringy when I'm walking in the hallways at Tri-State. And there was a, just a, there's a noise in that building that really gets my skin crawling and I didn't have it. So. That's my lesson. I also wore them all weekend when my grandkids were here. <laughs> What's the noise? At there's also state. It's just a super volume, um, high volume of voices mashed all oh, together. I guess that's fair. In yeah, the hallways, like, and it bounces a... around because everything's sort of flat oh, and really flat surfaces. Flat, yeah. But I have found walking around the hallways and trying to have conversations with people at something like conferences. Um, I wished I had them because I went to a, a, a conference in January at a camp and their dining hall was painful to sit in. The acoustics were so terrible there, which is like the camp that I grew up at, not the camp that Beth I, and I directed. I the, the, the acoustics are terrible. Pardon me? I find most dining halls do have bad acoustics. Yes. I'm yeah. honest. I've right. seen a bunch. So there you go. Cool. Wear some calmer earplugs. They're not plugs. Um, the filters or whatever in your countries. dining hall at camp or in other situations. Yeah. I'm Perfect. Okay. Chris, what is your tool? My tool of the week is actually something super practical. Hmm. So, you know, at the end of our camp season, and in this case, like recently, because I slowed around a lot, but uh, we release a camp yearbook and then hmm. it gets sent out to everybody uh, mm -hmm. who purchased one. Uh, so that's that's usually, you know, lately it's been me. Someone else is going to take over. But it's been me designing the yearbook and then ordering them and then individually packaging them and taking them in like a little red, you know, a, a little red wagon to the post office uh, and then paying hundreds of dollars to send it all over the country. Uh, and then one of my younger staff members was like, why don't you use pirate ship? And I was like, wow, this sounds like the beginning of a commercial. And listener, it is. Let me tell you about PirateShip.com. PirateShip.com uh, is something we did not use this year, but we are absolutely using in the future. PirateShip.com, if you have a scale at home and a printer, you can pr directly print out UPS and USPS labels on your printer. And the price, I was just checking while we were talking, 
the price differential, like each of these yearbooks, when I took it to the post office, was uh, like $9 and change to send one. Uh, Pirate Ship is quoting me at $6.12, which would have been impactful when it comes to the budget of having to send out like a couple of dozen of these things. So uh, I would buy a scale. I would get a yardstick or a meter stick, depending on which country you're in. And I would check out pirateship.com. Arg is the sound that pirates make. So many lessons today, Chris. Let me tell you something. <laughs> I'm full of it. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I, uh, I'm going to take a second and um, plug one other show before I say goodbye to these folks. Um, the I, I want to just make sure to draw your attention to the Camp Owners Podcast. What Howie and Kelly have done this year is bring in so many resources that are not just valuable for camp owners. So I invite you to search in your podcast app for the Camp Owners Pod. Um, they are doing one show a month and each one of them is incredibly impactful and i've learned some really great things from the stuff that they are sharing there so thank you to them for doing that and if you're looking for that recommendation i hope you go check that out and i hope you also check out jack's podcast um uh, jack can you tell us what you folks have been talking about lately on the camp summer camp society yeah thank you so much also could not recommend the camp owners podcast more um i love the camp packer podcast i love the summer camp society podcast that i'm about to plug that's ours and if i could recommend only one it would be howie and kelly's show i love what they do to pull back the curtain on on what's um going on behind the scenes from the the mindset of a camp owner and that impacts all the people at camp regardless of whether they're camp owners or not mm -hmm. and so I uh, couldn't recommend listening to it more uh, on the Summer Camp Society podcast. We've been doing a lot of talking about um, how to support staff specifically, staff these in, in today's world. What does it look like to come to camp? Uh, interviewing some staff, talking to people about how they communicate with staff differently, realizing that um, – you know, each generation of people has experienced different things as a collective, and therefore those experiences are going to make us all different. I remember um, sitting on a panel at the MAC conference with um, Travis, Beth, and uh, Dr. G, and maybe I think Laura was there too. And uh, we were talking about uh, how millennials were the worst uh, generation, Laura and I being the representatives of the the like very specific millennial generation, um, and like clowning together about about how each generation is the the worst generation every every generation that comes up and uh right now that's gen z is the worst uh generation which is uh, obviously silly but they are just different and so how do we support them as they come into camp what do they need to be successful what do they want to have the most fun um and so that's uh you know a lot of what we've been talking about thanks travis how do people follow up with you jack uh, you can find me uh, on the summercampsociety.com. Jack at the summercampsociety.com uh, is my email. And it always has the, the. make sure you, you it always has, the. yeah, it always has, it always has the for now, but maybe we should drop it like Facebook <laughs> or at least just buy the URL without the, the, so it's there and people, you can redirect it. Yeah. See, there you go. Yes, Communication the advice. marketing genius that we know and love. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jack. I really appreciate you being on again. Chris, how can people follow up with you or hire uh, you or sure. any of those things? Uh, people can stalk me on social media. Follow me on Instagram at planetchris1. You can also email me, chris at planetchris.net, which you should do if you have any like training or camp-related consulting needs. I can do it all. Um, if you see me on the street, just stop me and be like, hey, are you Chris Hudson? And I'll be like, yeah, I am. And we'll have a conversation. That'll be nice. See you soon. Thanks for the evening, friends.